Greetings, science fiction and fantasy enthusiasts. Do you read books? Do you watch films? Do you hate deodorant? Then welcome to our podcast. You're listening to No Deodorant in Outer Space with Ryan Sean O'Reilly. Now, let's get started. And they started getting into the Russian bunkers, slipping down when the lids were raised for air and a look around. One claw inside a bunker, a churning sphere of blades and metal, that was enough. And when one got in, others followed. With a weapon like that, the war couldn't go on much longer. Maybe it was already over. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of No Deodorant in Outer Space. My name is Ryan Sean O'Reilly. And joining me on this episode of the podcast is longtime contributor, co-host from seasons one through three, Richard Mel. Hey, how's it going, Ryan? Pretty good, Rick. How are you doing? Good. That's good. I'm glad you were able to join me after watching a football game this uh, Sunday mm-hmm. afternoon. No problem. I, I was trying to f- figure out if you were going to be available at the time we said, so I checked on the internet and I saw the game had had ended, but it went into overtime, and I was worried for a second, but I guess oh, it ended. Oh, no. Yeah, it only goes on for like another 10 minutes, so ah. we were still okay. All right, good. Well, glad you're able to join me. We're just It's just going to be a twosome. This is only the second time I've done a twosome on this, but I think we'll we'll be able to get into some fun discussion. I'm honored. Um, we're doing... Yes, and I'm honored to have you. We're doing a... We're, we're going to cover an author that we've covered every season, Philip K. Dick. We're going to cover two short stories by him, the first one being Second Variety and the other one being John's World. Rick, I think you were able, were you able to finish John's World? Um, no, not really. I, uh, I I had some trouble with what was, uh, transpired there, but, um, no, not really. But, um, I got a gist (laughs) of John's World with a, uh, with a podcast, but I mean, the guy was talking, I just didn't under, really understand what he was getting at. Probably because he was talking about a dick book, so. Oh, well, that was I mean, that was a really, re- podcast reviewing the story. Yeah, okay. It was another podcast reviewing the story, and I tried to take cliff notes. It's just that I didn't really, it's a combination of not really caring and the nature of <laughs> how dick stories really go, and it's just uh, just a malaise. Well, all right. Well, then we won't get too deep into John's world, I'm sure, but we are going to be covering Screamers, the movie, which starred Peter Weller. And you did see that, correct? Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Let's get into the book first in this book episode. Let's just each do like our kind of one line summary of the story of Second Variety. And I'll start us off. And my summary, my take on this story, just to set things up, is that it's a post apocalyptic Cold World style tale early in this author's career that contains entertaining edges and hints of emblematic future efforts in plot ideation and explorations into uncertainties for which this author is known. Uncertainties. Yeah. So yeah. Uncertainty. What, if you were to summarize your thoughts on this story? Oh, in it's just a, a sentence uh, or so. Yeah. It's, 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 it's just a sort of a, a, a paranoid, um, experience in, uh, the, um, the final war between, the United States and Russia, where uh, humanity lies on the brink and is about to pretty much extinct themselves with their own technology. All right, fair enough. The story, of course, is by Philip K. Dick, who we've covered, like I said, a number of times before. We did Total Recall, we did uh, Man the High Castle, and we also did uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep in previous seasons. I'm not going to give like a, a rehashing, hopefully, of, of his life, but just to get into a little bit more nuances of his biography, I did do some research. I, I took a look at this biography I've, I've looked at before. Um, I've never read the whole thing through, but I looked at relevant parts. And it's, it's called Divine Invasions, The Life of Philip K. Dick. It's by Lawrence Sutton, and it's pretty thorough. So I, I took a look at that to try to see, like, you know, what was going on with Phil's life around this time period. So I'll just get into that a little bit. Rick, feel free to comment or whatever at any time. Interrupt me with anything you care to think about this or if you want to add something. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
course, Philip K. Dick was born December 16th, 1928. He died March 2nd, 1982. So this story came out in, let me see my notes real quick, 53. Second Variety came out in 53, and John's World came out in 54. So they're both sort of written around the same time. So during this time period, Phil is on his second marriage. He married Cleo Apostolides. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing, I'm probably not pronouncing uh, her last name correct. But they married in June 1950. They met at this job he had. Uh, it was like a record store called Art Music. And they sort of bonded over music and books there. Um, this was kind of like the last of his jobs, I guess, where he was working like a day job before he became a full-time writer. So while he's doing this, he meets her. They move into an old two-story house in the Berkeley Flatlands where Phil had already been making like cheap monthly payments. The author noted that this was probably the most the eight most placid years of, of his life. He had, a uh, he was living <laughs> on the cheap. And I think he looked back on it that he was living very poorly, but he was probably pretty happy and things were going along pretty steadily. He, he wrote at night after work while listening to classical music with his cats falling asleep around him on his filing cabinet, things like that. He would tape rejections to the wall behind him of the stories he wrote. And then he'd send them right back out again. He had a fortuitous meeting, another fortuitous meeting at, at the uh, music store with a gentleman by the name of Anthony Bocher, who is the editor and co-founder of the magazine of science fiction, or the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, which is a magazine still around today, I believe, which a- a- emphasizes literary aspects over like hard sci-fi. Phil and this guy hit it off really well, and he, he felt like he found someone who was interested in the intellectual aspects of science fiction. The editor taught classes on science fiction, and he encouraged Phil to take his classes, and Phil did, and he would submit manuscripts that, you know, he could get critiques on. However, at some point, I think, like, his anxiety would get the best of him, and (laughs) after he had submitted a story for the class to be, to get critiqued on, he would send his wife to go take notes (laughs) on what people were saying, uh, Mm -hmm. because he was too nervous to hear it himself in person. When he turns about 21... Yeah, go ahead, Rick. That's just interesting. I, I, uh, I, I, he, he does come off as ultra sensitive and paranoid in his writing, um, but uh, as simple, I, and I think it's as, life, as yeah. simple as receiving feedback on, on your own writing that it just seems like a cop out. Sorry, but uh, well, I mean, I guess I can attest being in writing groups and stuff that it can be nerve wracking. You're you're putting your like it's almost like you're taking like a private part of yourself and like exposing it to the world. And, you well, know, in this case, it's like three people, basically, in a Berkeley bookstore, probably. Well, it, it, yeah, it could still be it could still be nerve wracking. Yeah. Because, you know, I've been in uh, small writing groups with just a handful of people and it still can be tense, especially if you don't like build up a tolerance for it. And, and, and also depends on where you're coming from. And we like you said, I think uh, Phil has his er- issues of paranoia already in his, his personal life. So anyways, he turns around. He turns 21, I think, in October of 1951, and at this point he sells his first story, Rug, to this editor. I think he sold it for 75 bucks. Then he sells another story to Planet Stories, and around this time he's fired from his job. He generally got along with the owner of the record store, but apparently one of the other, his other coworkers got fired, and there was an unemployment hearing, and Phil testified on behalf of the guy, and then later... Some other person at the store saw him talking to the fired employee and reported to the boss, and the boss felt this was Phil being disloyal, so he let him go. So I don't know if that starts to fuel Phil's paranoia, but he's, his writing started to take off now, so he, he focuses more on his writing. He, he made, like, two more attempts, I guess, at employment with record stores, but they were too, like, stiff-necked and formal for him to really settle into, so he kind of doesn't really get back into a full-time employment after that. Wow. And coinciding with all this, in the first half of the 1950s, you have an economic boom with the proliferation of the pulp magazines, which allowed writers to make a living in science fiction. So by 1953, there is something like 27 science fiction magazines. The post-war economic prosperity and intrigue with atomic destruction seem to also aid in the public's growing fascination with this genre. Phil's kind of getting into this right when things are taking off, which is allows him to, to, to become a writer. He obtains a literary agent 
with contacts uh, in New York based on pulp editors. Around that time, he's sold his fifth story. So Phil's publications go from four in 1952 to 30 in 1953. These are all short stories. And then in 28 in 1954. In 55, a British publisher chose 15 of his stories for a hardcover collection called A Handful of Darkness. And in 1957, a second collection is put out by famed publishing house Ace called The Variable Man. Between 51 and 58, he writes like 80 short stories and 13 novels. Looking back, he eventually didn't really think that the quality was so good of his early stuff as what he did later in his life, but he was very prolific. I mean, at some point he was doing like a story a week. He wrote two novels and started a third in 1952 and 53, but by 1954 he decided to focus himself more on novels. That same year he attended the 1954 Science Fiction World Convention, which is still goes on today, and uh, I've attended a couple of them. That's where the Hugo Awards are awarded. He goes to this, he's readily recognizable by people. He goes there, he gets to meet some of his literary favorites, like A.E. Van Boat, who wrote The World of Null A, and who also wore a glowing polyester suit, and indulged his questions about plotting novels. So Phil starts to do some thinking about his future and rationalizes that a magazine story might garner him like $20, but a novel could bring him in 4000 So he kind of, in his own writings, has said that like going to this world convention made him think, like, I need to start focusing on novels. But I guess, in, in truth, at this point, his literary agent already had like a, a manuscript in, in hand for a, a novel that he was already working on before the convention. But he was struggling, you know, to make ends meet. And he tells a story that at some point, like, he went to a pet shop and bought, like, horse meat, which was, like, essentially dog food. And he bought that to, like, live off of. And tells another story about sneaking into a movie theater to see a film with his wife. Um, oh, although she, she, she remarked in this biography that, that they were actually happy times. And she doesn't recall him, like, being miserable. Like, he kind of later indicated those times were... There were other problems, though, with being a science fiction writer. The royalties were kind of lousy. The writers didn't get much recognition outside of fandom. And even editors in the pulp magazines who were publishing all these stories were sometimes guilty of substantially revising the stories without getting the author's permission. Uh, In one such instance, Phil, who had a good relationship with the editor of Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine and its companion magazine, Beyond Fantasy Fiction... Uh, a gentleman by the name of H.L. Gold. Uh, Phil told the editor that he wouldn't sell him any more stories unless Gold stopped changing them. You know, even though this was like a main source of income for Phil. But after 1954, they didn't buy anything more from him. That said, Phil did later credit Gold with the ending of one of his stories called The King of Elves, which came out in 1953. But so he's just kind of like, everything's kind of pushing him more towards novels. Another thing of note I saw was a quote that from Phil that, He wasn't really impressed with early science fiction fandom, and he made the statement that the early fans were trolls and wackos. (laughs) So he he starts to have these aspirations to go like more mainstream at this point, and I think we talked about that in another podcast. He he makes this attempt to go more mainstream with his writing, and it, it never really works out, and then he ends up returning back to genre fiction. That's all later, though. In his personal life with his family, there was a couple things I noted that... Uh, he, he always had a strained relationship with his mother. You know, I think we talked about this early on. Phil was a twin. His sister died. His twin sister died when she was like six weeks old. I think he always blamed her for her, for her death. His wife at the time, Cleo, thought his mother kind of had a bitter view of the world, which she didn't share. And I guess she'd said that Phil did tell her stories of like his childhood woes with his mother. Mm. But in around 1952, his aunt Marion is diagnosed as a catatonic schizophrenic or at, around that time period she i'm sorry she dies in november of 1952 which is like right before these stories are coming out phil was mad at his mother as a result of his aunt's death because he felt that his mother like mishandled the the situation because his mother was sort of a health cult fanatic as this biographer put it health health cult um, yeah like a health cult fanatic like she was like just into like the latest like health crazes and stuff like that. So when his aunt is having this trouble, his mother and his aunt's husband like approve this kind of treat this off the wall treatment where their aunt goes and lives with this female physician who's going to like look out for her. 
and she goes and moves in with this lady. And then, like, I guess his mom told him later that his aunt was having wonderful visions that were helping to compensate with her painful circumstances. But there was also some quotes of, like, his aunt kept saying that she couldn't breathe. She couldn't breathe, and I don't know if they just thought it was, like, made up. And then eventually his mom realized, oh, wait, she, she really can't breathe, and they take her to the hospital. So she dies, and then the aunt's husband claims he gets, like, psychic visions from his deceased wife that he should marry Phil's mother, which would be his sister-in-law. And although she's has some reservations about this initially, she gets over it, and they do get married in <laughs> April of 1953. Oh, my God. So Phil's not happy about this, even though the marriage did last, uh, I guess, 18 years. But this author, the author of his biography felt that Phil kind of felt displaced by his aunt's husband, who is now his stepfather, because like the aunt had twins as well. And Phil was a twin, but his twin had died. And I think the, the uncle slash stepfather made some like overtures to try to like, you know, have a relationship with him. But I think Phil just wasn't into it. So that was kind of going on like around that time period before and sort of during as he's coming up these stories. And I just thought those were kind of important things or big things in his life that, you know, may have like gotten into this, uh, influencing these stories. But that's, that's all I had. I know eventually he gets like visits from the FBI and stuff, which we mentioned before, but I think they, they might have started around this time period, but they kind of, I think, are a little bit later from what I could tell. So that's what I have about Phil. On a personal note, is there anything you want to add about Phil? Um, Are you good? Yeah, you know, through our discussions about Philip K. Dick, it just seems like he really struggled his entire life. It's almost as if he lived his life on a plot of quicksand, almost, and just tried to scratch his way out of that. And I don't know, I don't think he ever really successfully did. But um, yeah, yeah, he, he had a hard life, you know, and. It, it really kind of shows in his works as well. Yeah. I mean, it, he's also often noted for, like, as you said, like, as you were saying to me offline, like, he, he's kind of crazy plots of paranoia and stuff like that. But, like, you have stuff going on in his life that you can see have him struggling with paranoia and, and trust, like, you know, like, an actual visit from the FBI and then, like, his relationship with his mother and, and you know, whatever, what, everything that went on there. But, all right. So that's Phil. Let's get into the actual story. So Second Variety, which came out in 53, and I, as I said before, it came out in Space Science Fiction Magazine. John's World came out in 54, actually in an anthology called Time to Come. So that came out later. Second Variety... Just to give like a brief synopsis and we can get into it more as we did the discussion, but it's, it's set in a post-apocalyptic world where Soviet forces used uh, atomic weapons to preemptively bomb their enemies, and they nearly succeeded in their efforts until UN forces developed self-replicating artificial robot weapons known as claws that are capable of autonomously killing off the Soviet forces who lack these special tag devices uh, which tell the claws not to kill them. However, the claws start to evolve beyond the capabilities in which their creators intended by being able to mimic humans. Havoc ensues when the newly minted machines pursue their original intention to an unintended consequence. That's just kind of a quick overview of the story. So, the story starts off with, it's, it's, the world is, well, why don't you set the scene, Rick? I've talked a lot here. The opening yeah. scene, like, you're kind of in like a, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so the the story takes place on Earth, which is basically just this big ball of slag and dust right yeah. now after quite a bit of nuclear war between Russia and the UN. Now the, the local setting is at a base that is being held by the soldiers that represent the UN. They're in uh, like bunkers, they're, right? They're in a bunker like and they're just keeping an eye out and... They notice a uh, a Russian sh soldier approaching, and uh, they're they're getting all paranoid about this guy approaching. And lo and behold, one of their uh, devices that that burrow the themselves the claws they burrow themselves under the ground. They, the thing gets this guy, and um, it's 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 pretty graphic. These things kind of approach the victim 
underground and then they when they when they come up they they crawl up these people and they go right for the throat and they 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 finish them off they kind of piece them up and put them somewhere i i guess underground yeah it's almost like they kill them and then like clean up the bodies or something right and and the, the story really kind of started out with a nice cadence it was kind of clear i like the writing but uh it progressed with this Russian sh- soldier brought with him a a note uh, to correspond with this bunker. They took the note; it was left on the on the ground, and they they took it. Now they they can't be attacked by claws because they they're wearing like these bracelets that wore these the UN claws. forces. Yes, so they were able and to then, get out I there guess and that's... retrieve this note, right? That's the only way they, they can't get attacked, right, is they have to wear these, like, tabs or tags or whatever that, around their wrists. And if they're not wearing them, they will get attacked by these machines. Right, right. Which... That's the only way the machines... And I didn't understand, like, why wouldn't the Russians have a way to, like, reverse engineer these tabs or something and have their own, but whatever. Yeah. Maybe it was just a really good secret, but... um yeah, uh, unfortunately, you know, they, they designed these claws to replicate themselves and to be autonomous. So that really kind of gets into the uh, the rest of the story because they're asked to um, come out and communicate with the Russian front line that's out there, I don't know, a few miles away. I don't know what really motivates them to, to go ahead and do this, but obviously they've been sitting in this bunker for a long time and they're they're just sort of anxious to make something happen and... That they, I think they believe that this is the Russians' um, declaration of uh, surrender. So I think that's how yeah, they were inspired it, yeah, to right. kind of get out there and follow up on the note. Right, because so, they think that the, the claws are being successful for them, that the claws have actually brought the Russians to their knees, and it might make sense that the Russians are now looking to negotiate peace terms. Right. So, so I mean, he, they're, they're suspicious. They're suspicious. He does like a call back to Earth to get like – yeah permission to go there right yeah yeah so they should be feeling pretty secure in the the new set of circumstances because of these claws and they they have all the confidence in the world that these claws have been taking care of business and and i think this is on like u.s soil and the the russians have sent their paratroopers in i don't i mean i don't know how you invade a large country like the united states but you know there are paratroopers there there are russian military personnel all over the place in the United States and they feel like their claws have taken the tide back in their favor. So they go out there, yeah. they, they, it's, it's, I think it's a major, there, there's like a corporal, a lieutenant and a major. And I think the major ends up going out there and it's just kind of, yeah, it's, it's major Hendrickson, major Hendrickson, I, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Or Hendricks. Sorry. Yeah, and one thing that you don't realize until Major Hendricks gets to the Russian bunker is that the claws are replicating, but they're also evolving. And you find this out uh, once Major Hendricks gets to that uh, Russian bunker. So uh, on his way there, he comes across a, a desolate boy who's probably not more than 10 years old he's holding a teddy bear and he's coming out of this rubble so he's asking um, major hendrix to to accompany him and hendrix is on this critical mission he doesn't want to take him but he ends up doing it out of you know just some sympathy or empathy, empathy yeah. sure so he one of the one of the most memorable parts of the story is that they are they're approaching this bunker and the the kid is just blasted away and um, it kind of yeah. takes everyone with their guard down, especially Major Hendricks and the readers. But um, Hendricks was like, hey, what the hell is going on? And he he looks at the body, and it's just a bunch of springs and wires. And so he realizes that the boy was some kind of cybernetic design that was – he didn't really know what what the hell was going on there. But Well, I think the Russians – It was all the explained Russians to him. In. Right. It was all yeah, explained they to him did. later on. Yeah, they they tell him the the boy is, is just another claw, but like an evolu like an evolution of the claws. Right. They've, the claws have made this huge leap. Although I think previous to that, they talk about the claws do evolve somewhat, but not to this level. 
and the UN forces were not aware of this, but the Russians Which were is because hard they, to believe. they yeah. Yeah, it's it's a big jump from these like spheres that have like blades to like basically a human humanoid. Humanoids, yeah. Replicants or something. The Russians explained to him that their whole bunker was like wiped out. Now the claws were doing this previously, the old versions, but now the the, the Russians have taken like big massive losses because they were tricked by these claws that look like humans. And he meets two other Russians. Uh, what are their names? One of them's Klaus and the other one's Rudy. They bring him back to not the main bunker where he was headed, but like a side bunker underground area where there's a young woman named Tazo. And they explain that there's no, there's like no one left from the main bunker, right? Everyone's been wiped out by these like kid claws or whatever. And, and they tell him there's another uh, version of the claws a wounded soldier. So there's another like replicant robot thing that looks like a man with like what a missing leg or something. And he's just like he's hobbling like around. Yeah. Yeah. He's on a crutch. Okay. And that one has also tricked them. So now that's all that's left of this bunker is these two guys. And we find out that they, the only reason they survived is because this woman is a prostitute and they were visiting her and they just happened to be visiting her when their bunker got wiped out. I think they're the ones that sent the note, right? That other guy that, got killed by the claws was from them right yeah, possibly rudy I, I never caught that but i don't know exactly who sent the note out they all seemed like they were expecting him because yeah, they yeah. had you know not, none of them were shocked to see an american in their bunker and they all looked like they yeah. wanted to collaborate with him in some fashion yeah doesn't he well first of all you get you get the sense of this whole planet you know that, that everything is devastated because they're like as soon as they do all this they're like you have to go underground with us quickly because the claws are going to come back i mean mm-hmm. they killed that one robot boy but like the boy was get underground yeah the boy tagged him and the boy basically marked their location so they feel like they needed to get out of there as soon as possible yeah um, so they go and they hide and they talk to him and then they they basically they want him to communicate back with the un forces to, to I, I think they want to go back with him right and so they can get out of there because they're like, yeah, look, they're, you, you guys made these things and they're out of control. To go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, how could you do yeah. this? And obviously, Major Hendricks is like, you know, <laughs> it's not my fault. You know, yeah, it is um, yeah. a handful, but, you know, this is the ugliness of war, right? So, um, yeah, and they they hang out in this bunker for a little while. And I I think... It's at this point there is a like a question of distrust evolves between the Russian the two Russian soldiers where one of them accuses the other one of being a claw. Doesn't that happen in this bunker before they leave? Yes. I think it's Rudy and this other guy. Um Rudy ac- accuses Klaus. No, Cla- no, no. Klaus, Klaus accuses, accuses Rudy, but he doesn't really get into right. it with Rudy. He just basically blasts him. But yeah, you, he ends up, you don't he ends really, up killing him. Right? Yeah, you don't really uh, – you're not exposed to the dialogue as a reader because during this time, Taza, I believe, takes Hendrix into the back room to ask for a cigarette and she's just trying to seduce him. And the whole the whole scene lies there while – and then, you know, I oh, guess yeah, when right, Hendrix right. turns his back on Taza, he walks out of the room and Rudy's at, you know um, – the gunpoint of the other gentleman of Klaus of yeah. Klaus who ends up just blasting him and there's your other shocker yeah because Klaus claims that Rudy is a, a a claw a robot but but then when Rudy is dead they see he's just got blood and guts there's he's no blood and guts. yeah yeah no there's no springs like there was with David the the boy robot so like okay you just killed a, a human now because you thought he was a robot and this is not good this is not cool and then Tazo comes out, the, the the woman, and she's like, wait, why did Klaus do that? Maybe he is a robot. And th- and that's where I feel like this is like the meat of like, <laughs> this is where you're, now you're really into a Philip K. Dick tale. Because like, this is like what he does. He makes you like unsettled with what's real, what's not real, who do you trust, who can't you trust. Right. And re- remember the, the cadence that I talked about at the beginning of the story? Well, that cadence is completely, you know, just kind of got swallowed up in this this pool of quicksand because now you don't know what's going on and you just you're just gonna let it play out from this point you you don't see you, there's no anticipation for anything specific anything could happen 
Yeah. I mean, I, to me, this is like the strong point in the story right here where you're, you, you're trying to go along with this character and then all of a sudden everything's flipped on its head and you don't, you, like you just said, you don't know what's going to happen next. I saw some like uh, reviewers and articles where people say like this story is one of Phil's earlier stories that kind of shows where his writing is going to go in the future. You know, mm-hmm. which we probably saw like in we've, Man in the High yeah, Castle and stuff that came out. Every every yeah. book I think we've read, yeah, yeah, and that all came out later from this. So this is like his one of his early uh, attempts at this. So Hendrix is like, he's like, wait a second, wait a second, like let's stop this madness and everyone just calm down. So he like no more bloodshed happens. They're basically like, can you contact your base? And they make the decision to for him to try to, con- but. So he, I think at some point he tries to contact his base. He has to stick his head out from the bunker to get like a signal. And I think like they can't hear him or something like that. So it's determined that they have to just go there physically on foot. Isn't that what happens? I believe so. There, there was very limited conversation. It seemed like as soon as he tried to reach back uh, to his initial bunker, there was a combination of uh, bad transmission and just like these monotone responses uh, coming back from his lieutenant and his lieutenant just completely disengaged at this point. So now there's questions about, Hey, did their base or did their bunker get uh, penetrated by these, um, these uh, new types of uh, humanoids or claws, right? Yeah. This is where like the, like, like Philip just starts, he starts ramping up the tension. Like you, you see like, okay, the, the one Russian soldier gets killed. Oh, he wasn't a claw. He's really a human. And then it's like, wait a second, did, did the claws infiltrate my own base after I left? Because yeah. we didn't even know these existed. And so, he's like, I need, I need to get back there and tell them that these other claws exist, but it might be too late. It's your uh, typical Dickian cloud here, your, your fog. Yeah. It's just everywhere. Yeah. So they, they set out, the three that are left, Klaus and Tazo and Hendrix. And they, they go to his base, and, and he's making contact, like you said, with his uh, lieutenant, or uh, who's like his friend, Scott, uh, is, the guy, is the guy's last name, I think. And the responses are just like monotone. They're just like, he's like, so they, they get like, it's really co- a pretty cool tense scene, because they, they get outside the bunker, and he's just like, hey, he's trying to tell them, like, there's stuff going on with other claws. And they're like, yeah, he's like, is everything okay back there? And his old lieutenant is just like, yes, everything's fine. Come on down. Come on down. And, and then he gets really suspicious and paranoid. And Hendrix is like, no, wait, you come up. And Hendrix is outranks him, right? So he orders him, no, That's you right. come up here. Right. And his lieutenant's like, no, come down. And it's just like really m- monotone. It's making you think like, okay, uh, his lieutenant is not him. It's like, it's a robot. Right. Someone completely invested into the story would be at like this fever pitch at this point. But I mean, I wasn't I, okay. <laughs> I mean, anything's going to happen. I mean, in, in any any Philip K. Dick book, I mean, they don't necessarily end well. So you're already prepared for like the worst. So it's like okay, just get on with it. <laughs> well, let me remove let me the ask fog, you if, please. If you had not read any of his anything else by him. Prior to this, would you have a, uh, been more riveted? I don't know, possibly, but because uh, you read this n- knowing like how he is, yeah, right. So it probably right. it, it gave I, you a different possibly, uh, possibly. You yeah. know, um, yeah. if I saw this with a fresh set of eyes, without knowing uh, his persona and the way he likes to just kind of screw over his main characters, yeah. <laughs> so then, what happens next is, I think finally. The, uh, the bunker just opens, right? I don't think they... they know, he doesn't go down there, right? Yeah, I believe it does open. He ends up going in without... Oh, uh, he does. ...being able to command his lieutenant to come up, I believe. Okay, but then quickly he sees, like, a, like what, like 50 Davids in there? I believe so. Or like, a, yeah. like, just, like a massive just, amount of these David robots. An yeah, and, and they of just, those boys with their teddy bears, yeah. Yeah, and they just come, come like flooding out, and I think even some of the wounded soldiers might be with. And so then it, it's just like chaos happens after that because they're like they're fighting, and these robots are coming after them. At this point, we know that the protective wristband tab won't work; it will only work against the old variety of uh, claws, mm-hmm. the the the, uh, the, the early models. Yeah. 
Yeah. But these David ones and the Wounded Soldier varieties, it's not going to work. When it ends up happening is I think Klaus gets injured, and when this is going on, suddenly Tazo pulls out like a hand grenade and just like blows up all these Davids, and, and this is like a big explosion. Then she grabs Hendrix and is like, we have to get out of here. And he's like, what about Klaus? And she's, she's just like, forget him. And they sort of abandon Klaus to be kind of mauled over by the early version Claws. Because he, they're like, if they leave him there and he doesn't have a wristband, he'll get attacked by the early version Claws. But she's like, we need to get out of here. Right. And she takes him away. So then, then what happens next? I think there's like another opportunity for a sex scene once they kind of get free but i think they're talking about a uh a way out uh i think they're i think he's being off Hendrix is being solicited to uh call in one of the ships from the moon base that um the un holds at this point to like you know the command center for the war is on the moon and somehow she knows this and is asking questions about well call in a ship and let's get the hell out of here. This is uncontrollable. Yeah. And then I believe, and he's uh, like, yeah, he, he, he can't, he can't call on a ship, I think. And, and she's like, we need to get out of here. Well, I mean, I guess to set this up properly, like the majority, like you said, the unit forces are all on this moon base, which is like a secret location on the moon or something like that. Right. And I guess most of the, I guess it's mostly Russians that are left and UN fighting forces on actual earth. Mm-hmm. The rest of the citizens are, are of the UN forces are on the lunar base, kind of out of harm's way. So he's trying to rack his brains on on what needs to be done. Then he, re- and I don't remember what happens first, but at some point he remembers that there is a spaceship that can possibly be used to go back to the moon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they do run into the spaceship, right? Yeah, she's like, we need to go there. And he, he can't think of where it is. And then he does think of where it is. But I think does Klaus come back before that? He does come back. You know, obviously he's, well, it's not obvious at this point, but like he survives all these underground claws. He yeah. comes back. And how did that interchange go? Um, he comes back and he's like, I think he's like looking like a injured soldier until they realize it's Klaus. And then I think, th- I think. Tazo just shoots him. I think she does, yeah. Kind of like how Klaus shot uh, Rudy, because she shoots him, and then you see the um, gears and stuff on him. And she's like, yeah, he, he was the he was another one, another robot. Mm-hmm. So it's just like another mind fuck. <laughs> right. So then, okay, so then they're like, we need to find the spaceship. They finally go to the spaceship, and Hendrix is injured at this point. And when they find the spaceship, he's not doing so hot. And also the spaceship only has one seat on it. So it's sort of indicated that they can only one of them will be able to go on the spaceship. And Tazo tells him, look, you're too injured. There's only one seat. You should just let me go to the lunar base and I'll send back help. Mm -hmm. And he sort of resists her at first. And then she just talks him into it. The key point is that this base on the moon can't just be found. Like you have to go there and you have to like broadcast these signal codes and when the signal codes are given then the base will reveal itself and they'll like be able to go to the base and he has the signal codes i and this was another plot point i wanted to ask you and if i don't know if you have any thoughts on this but i guess hendrix would be the only one with these signal codes i don't know if any of his other soldiers would have had them or not i mean they're all dead i guess anyways he was this the point. highest ranking member in that bunker so so probably maybe, he did maybe he, yeah yeah Obviously, the signal codes are top secret, and he hesitated yeah. before giving them to her. But you know, he finally came to the conclusion that this was kind of the only way. There was only one seat. He was injured, and she was kind of like their last hope. And I think, you know, obviously, I think she probably put an impression on him from the get go. So, yeah, she ends up getting in the spaceship and uh, takes it up, and but um, then. Yeah, yeah. Go like ahead. he realizes. How did he realize that she was? A, uh, I, a, a I'll humanoid. You, I forget. I'll just. I just like listen to the story. It's you can list. There's the uh, audio versions of the story online in podcast format because I, I think it might be in public domain because there's also ebook formats that are available on Amazon. But as she takes off, I think all of a sudden, like copies of her start appearing out of wherever oh, yeah. and coming yeah. at him with these grenades. <laughs> Yeah. And he's, I think he tries to fight them off at first and he realizes that they, they have the same grenade she had. 
and yeah, he's so like, he's oh my God. Yeah. yeah, he's done. And she was really a claw. And he also looks at the brain from Klaus and realizes at some point that like Klaus was not the second variety. That's you know, why the story's called Second Variety. They're checking on the varieties of these humanoids, right? So Yeah. And he assumed that Klaus was the second variety because I think Tazo tells him that. But really, when he looks at Klaus's brain, it's he's like the fourth variety. So then it's like obvious that Taza would be the second variety, and she tricked them all along. But his last thought, which I also saw in a review, which kind of puts an interesting twist on the story, is he screwed up. You know, he sent this killer robot to find the lunar base where the remaining humans are and given the robot the secret code. So he's basically doomed mankind's future. However, he sees the Tazo robots coming at him with their grenades, and he remembers that they killed the Klaus robot and the, uh, the the boy robot and the other, and he realizes the claws are already fighting amongst themselves. And he's like, wait a second, the claws have evolved to a point where they're now attacking each other, kind of like how humans were attacking each other. So he's like, maybe we're not so doomed? Or he takes comfort in the fact that, yeah, I screwed up and I gave this code to this claw, but but the claws are probably going to end up destroying themselves. Yeah, that was the one shining light in, at the end of the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's almost like a mirror. Like, I mean, he wrote this in the early 50s. You got the Cold War. I mean, that's still going strong, right? And Cold War stories are kind of a thing at this point. I mean, it's sort of like a lesson in, like, you know, uh, nuclear war and the ability of, you know, man to keep making these crazy weapons to destroy each other and then them getting out of control, which in this place, in this point, it's not the atomic weapons. It's these self-replicating robots that kind of go beyond what the atomic weapons were going to do. So it's almost like a, I don't know, his early stuff is described almost as like a parable in, in some ways, but I don't know. How did it leave you? I don't know. Just the sense of doom, right? Yeah. You got all of this uh, high technology that was, initiated by uh, the two combatants of the initial war, and it all kind of unraveled. Uh, usually that's how wars go. So, you know, it's easy to start a war, but it's never easy to end one. So this uh, this looks yeah, like that's implied, uh, right. it would have been like a, uh, a perpetual war on Earth where humans are no longer involved. Um, so maybe the next stop for them would be Mars or something. But first, they got to take care of this Taza coming at them. Well, and, and the claws are an interesting thing because it, it, that is literally a technology like that is, you know, it's out of control. Like they, it's like it's opening. They literally opened Pandora's box and created these claws that now like are killing everything. Right. Right. Unintended consequences. Right. Right. All right. Let me just stop there and, and talk a little bit about John's world. This is a kind of interesting thing because I know we won't really get into a big discussion about John's world because you haven't read it, but Philip wrote this other story, which is set in the same universe as the claw universe, but it doesn't involve any of the same characters. The, the claws exist and it's set in the future. So you kind of see the result of what happens with the claws. And it's like another short story. And I don't know if this is like the only time he did this, in John's world, you have these characters who travel back in time to steal the paperwork from the scientist who invented the artificial intelligence, which led to the basis of this of creating the claws that were in the story Second Variety. The setting is the claws have killed themselves. That's all done. But the planet is so devastated that humans need laborers now to help them, like, replant the surface and start over again. And they're like, hey, you know what? We probably need some artificial intelligent robots to help us with this. And there's, I think, some concern that, like, wait a second, are we going to really mess with this again? Because look what happened last time. But I guess there's such a labor shortage that they determined that they do need that. The mission of these characters, there's two characters, a Mr. Kastner and uh, Mr. Ryan, they're going to, they build a time machine and they're going to go back in time and get these papers, and, tr and but they don't want to kill the inventor of uh, the clause. They just want to take his papers and bring them back. And along the way, they stop a couple times at different time periods to see what's going on with the world because they just want to, you know, like they'd never even seen the claws. And they stop at one point, like when the, there's nothing left on the planet but the claws. And they sh and it shows these Davids and these wounded soldiers like attacking each other. Like, it, there's, like there's just like a face-off 
and they just kind of witness the scene and then they get back in their time ship and take off. And then they land in this, um, they go further back in time to where the scientist is, Mr. Shonerman, and they get in the space and they have to steal the papers, but their efforts go south and they end up in like a, a gunfight as they're trying to get back to their spaceship and they end up, um, they're not sure, but they might have, they definitely hurt the scientist, but they're not sure if he's dead. So on the way back to their time period, they stop one more time and one of them grabs a newspaper to see what happened. And then the newspapers all say like, oh, it was a Soviet attack against our, our base. And they don't really realize it was people from the future, but it turns out that the inventor was killed. And so they're like, you know, we screwed up with the future. Then you have these two guys, one of them, and I get, I can't remember offhand, but one of them decides that we shouldn't bring these papers back. We shouldn't bring this technology back with us. We need to like not have it. And I think what he does is he uses his gun to just burn up all the papers against the other guy's will. The story is like sort of um, bookended in the beginning it starts with the one of the characters' son, Ryan's son, named John, has these like visions, and they sort of determine he's like mentally ill because he keeps having these visions where he is like seeing like another version of reality, and he sees this like agrarian kind of societies where these people are just walking around in long flowing robes and they're just talking about philosophy and things, and they're and they're just like living off the land and there's animals and stuff around, and everyone's sort of at, at peace. Ryan, who is like the like inventor of the time machine, he's like worried about his son who's having these more and more of these visions. So he ends up ordering like a lobotomy for his son <laughs> to like help cure him of these visions. I guess the lobotomy does happen and his son is cured of these visions. Well, it turns out at the end, when they go back to this, the, the future, they go back to their present. They go back in the past, they steal the papers and they destroy the papers and the inventor is killed. And they create an alternate timeline where the clause never existed. And there is a war, but they find out the war was fought differently with different technology, and it was over quicker. People just learn to evolve and get to, like, a happier place. It's the place that his son was visioning all along. So then he realizes, like, wait, maybe crazy people in history, like medieval mystics and stuff, they weren't actually crazy. They were actually seeing, like, alternate timelines. And he's like, now we, we are in this alternate timeline, this alternate possibility. And so that, that's, that's basically the story. It's, I don't know, it's kind of interesting that he decided to go back and explore this topic and do something different with it. And I guess one of the questions that was raised by one of the reviewers, um, and I think you listened to that podcast, Rick, by that guy who talked about the story, is that, does that ending ruin the ending of Second Variety? Because Second Variety ends with like a very bitter ending or like where the main character screwed up and sent the robots or sent the, the Tazo robot back to the, 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 the hidden moon base and he's doing mankind, but he does know the robots are going to kill themselves, which I guess does happen, but, um, it's just very bleak. But in, in second variety, we learn, yeah, the robots kill themselves, but then a time machine was invented and people go back in time and take away the technology to have the robots. And then they get the planet to a better, more peaceful place. Mm. So it's like, is second variety like the doom that was forecast and like the the tone of it is that like cheapened by the way he ends things in John's world? I don't know. I guess I don't think it matters really. Yeah, I don't think Dick really intended to make this a sequel of Second Variety. Second Variety might have inspired John's world, but yeah. uh, knowing Phil Dick and the, the way that he just kind of goes about things in a half baked manner it, it i don't think he really cares if you think this is like a continuation of a uh, second variety <laughs> it's uh, I, I i think he just did this story because yes he he did obliterate humankind in uh the first book and in the second book maybe yeah maybe he had some nagging thoughts about it being so dismal there uh in in second variety so he continued it but I don't think it was with um, any intent to just show his readership that, like, um, yeah, the humankind is uh, stronger than you think. And no, it was just uh, – I think he just kind of gravitated back to this idea of uh, the effects of uh, an unwieldy uh, military-industrial complex taking things over. So I, 
it's all just a malaise, man. I mean, I, I don't think Phil Dick really wanted his readers to hold this inspiration for humankind and their ability to come back with the time machine or whatever. But, I mean, it was a convenient way for him to kind of re-explore this post-apocalyptic world that he had set up. I don't know if you were to just take John's world on its own, if if you would have been sort of uh, in the dark about, hey, what, well, what had happened in John's world? I'm sure it was all explained in, or, you know, what had happened in Second Variety. But I, I, I think... I think you're better off just kind of taking the two separate stories on their own. I don't think they were ever intended on being really related. It, I think the second story just took from concepts of the first one. And Yeah. I mean, to me, I think that they can sit side by side fine. And I think it's kind of goes with Philip K. Dick's themes of like exploring alternate realities and just talking about there being alternate realities. And so you can just lay this second story next to the first one as a, like another possibility and sure. like just, and, and they can be considered on their own and it's you like don't have to like recycle job yeah. though. I mean, I don't know. I think it well, was just half ass. I guess I don't agree with you there. I don't think it's a recycle job. I think he just like looked at something else to explore and I don't think he negated his first effort. I think he did succeed in going in a different direction and making something else you can look at to reflect on. Right. Yeah. But he know, did differently. He, he recycled some of the old, concepts that were introduced in second variety and uh yeah. you know i guess it ends up working out for him i mean it's a nice platform to lean on but uh yeah but he does different things he does time travel and stuff like that which is not in the first one yeah. so, and it's all different characters right i mean he doesn't just like i think i saw the term in one of the reviews that like he doesn't like just like retcon you know like decide like oh like i'm gonna take what i wrote before and just change everything this is like something different and something new. Mm -hmm. You're not just getting more of the same in a different, uh, like he didn't just take the same thing, just like mashing up in a different order and give it back to you. Mm -hmm. He like takes some of the same and like t puts it in a different direction. Yeah. 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 You, you, I guess if you look at both of these stories, you, you could, you could imagine how these stories inspired uh, other stories after it especially in the movies, popular movies. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, there's a pretty long list of movies that uh, that probably borrowed from these concepts. Well, that's a, uh, that's a good segue. Why don't, we, why don't we end things here and just give our final like star rating and comment, and then we can move into the movie episode. Sure. All right, so then I'll just start things off and say I'm going to give this book, or this story, probably I guess both of the stories if I was to rate both of them, but I'm going to give it three and a half. Three and a half? Oh. Stars. Three and a half. It's pretty good. So, yeah, I liked it, and I you know, I remember reading uh, another collection by him when we did uh, We Can Remember For You Wholesale, which is the short story Total Recall was based on, and there's some of the older stuff that he did, like Rug, the story that he first published. This is like better than that. I think he gets into some, like people have said, he gets into some of the interesting concepts that he's going to get into later. And so to me, this story is not like drop dead awesome, but it's, it's a solid story. And maybe if you're a fan of Philip K. Dick, it, it feels a little recycled, but it's, it, it's interesting and a nice perspective of, of where he comes from and it works by itself. So I think it's like above average story and, um, and, and worth checking out. So that's why I'm going to give it three and a half stars. What about you? Out of five, how many would you give it? Okay, so what I thought about the second variety, I I, I just I, I, there was not enough cohesion with the plot line and with the uh, with with the realistic options that were there. It just seemed like things just appeared and disappeared out of the convenience for the writer. Um, I think it was just all a matter of convenience for him to just make the story is like it was I don't think there was really like an intriguing plot here it was more of like a statement about war and its unwieldy ways and it just didn't it didn't attract me it didn't inspire me read, to read more dick books so with that I am going to give it two stars okay 
I can, I can see what you're saying with like the war stuff. Like it's, it feels a little, I don't know, regurgitative or something, but all right, fair enough. So I will invite people to tune in later in the month when we're going to cover the movie screamers, which is based on the, the one story, uh, second variety. Till then, I would also ask people to go to our website, www.nodeodorant.com, and you can also subscribe and write reviews of the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and even on YouTube. All the places you can find podcasts, you will find our podcast. So until then, I'll say good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. For more information on the topics discussed in this episode, or to read our show notes and find us on social media, visit nodeodorant.com. For more information on Ryan Sean O'Reilly and his various works of fiction, visit ryanshawnoreilly.com. The theme music for this podcast was written by John Doyle from the band I Decline. You can visit him at i-decline.com. Voiceover for this podcast was provided by me, Margaret O'Reilly. Well, that concludes our episode. We hope you've learned a lot. Again, thanks for listening to our show. And always, always remember, there is no deodorant in outer space. sound like i'm getting over a cold because i am I, I got a plane going overhead so just give me a moment here oh, okay <clears throat> perfect timing yeah all right all right Rick. all right